It's time uh, to start. And uh, on behalf of uh, uh, myself, Cardiovascular Research, uh, ESC Journal, as well as uh, Council for uh, Basic and Cardi Basic Cardiovascular Sciences of the ESC and uh, uh, Professor Christian Weber, who is leading that council. I would like to welcome everyone uh, to our uh, first uh, and, and webinar uh, in the series called uh, Discoveries in Cardiovascular Research. Uh, this series uh, is designed uh, in order to share not only the novel discoveries that uh, our speakers have uh, usually contributed to over the recent years, uh, but also to provide advice to uh, young researchers on design and development of their own studies and uh, uh, introduce into sort of interaction between our leaders and uh, uh, basic science researchers uh, and uh, uh, accomplished uh, uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, we will organize these seminars uh, uh, once a month and uh, uh, you will be sent uh, the uh, plan for the next seminar very uh, soon. Uh, thank you very much to uh, uh, that so many people have uh, joined us and continue joining us. Uh, this uh, webinar has a total number of participants that are possible uh, limited at 500 people and uh, anyone joining us above that will be transferred to our uh, YouTube streaming service uh, in order to be able to participate that way as well. The uh, uh, first uh, uh, of the series, uh, uh, maybe I will also emphasize the fact that this is uh, the initiation of a very close collaboration in respect to webinars between our journal, Cardiovascular Research, and Council for Basic Cardiovascular Sciences of the ESC. We thought that uh, working together on this uh, important initiative can bring uh, a modern science and uh, ability to interact uh, to uh, our community uh, better than organizing two seminars alone. And uh, thank you very much uh, to Christian uh, for uh, uh, cooperation and uh, proposing this, uh, this cooperation to us. Thank you. Um, this uh, uh, month seminar is focused on nets, as you will uh, see, and uh, we will have two excellent uh, uh, talks. Uh, the first one uh, will be delivered by uh, Professor Peter Libby uh, from Harvard Medical School, who is a cardiovascular medicine specialist in Brigham and Women's Hospital and a professor of medicine at uh, Harvard Medical School. He has contributed to wide range of uh, cardiovascular discoveries in a relation particularly to the understanding of inflammation and immunity in uh, uh, atherosclerosis, uh, its complications and cardiovascular disease. I think we all know his uh, work and his publications and admire it and have been admiring it for many years. Therefore, it's a huge honor for us, uh, Peter, to host you uh, in this uh, inaugural uh, seminar. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, ask you to uh, provide the first lecture. Great, thank you very much. Do you have my screen? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so these are my uh, competing interests. I don't accept any uh, personal payment uh, from uh, pharma or device companies. So. Uh, one of the things that there's been a lot of noise about over the last decades is the uh, so-called vulnerable plaque, which you see here with a uh, fibrous cap that's thin and has ruptured and has uh, caused the thrombus that led to the death of this patient. And in my laboratory, we spent uh, maybe 20 years or maybe more uh, working out the cell and molecular biology of the thin cap fibroatheroma. And I'm not going to tell that story here. You heard it from me before. Uh, where when you have inflammation in the intima, there's decreased synthesis and increased breakdown of the collagen that forms the fibrous cap that protects the plaque from rupture. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm a doctor and I see patients and I've noticed uh, that there's a trend in changing the face of the acute coronary syndromes. And with uh, Harald Pastakam a few years ago, uh, we provocatively called for a requiem for the so-called vulnerable plaque. Uh, you know, in medicine, as in the military, we often face today's battle, prepared to fight the last war. And my contention is that the disease is shifting uh, before our eyes and we need to refocus our efforts. 
that the so-called vulnerable plaque is uh, not a valid concept these days. Uh, why? Because we're so good at managing the risk factors, the demographics have uh, shifted. We have younger people, more women, more uh, minorities. And human plaques display fewer characteristics of vulnerability. And we documented that with Herard uh, when he looked at the uh, Athro Express data bank and showed that if you compare time periods, uh, that there's less inflammation and less lipid corresponding to decrease in smoking and increase in lipid lowering therapies. The final blow to the concept of the vulnerable plaque is from interventional studies that used intravascular imaging to characterize plaques and found that less than 5% of the thin cap fiber atheroma followed for more than three years will actually cause a clinical event. So vulnerable plaque is a misnomer. This uh, schema, which I published a long time ago, made the point that when we lower lipids and attack inflammation, that we can decrease the inflammatory cell content, decrease the lipid content and reinforce the plaque's fibrous cap. And uh, that conjecture that we made uh, based on animal studies in the 1990s was borne out by human imaging studies that are summarized here. Uh, so in our laboratory, maybe six, seven years ago, we changed our focus from trying to understand plaque rupture, which we thought we'd worked out to a large extent as had other laboratories, and focus on another mechanism known as superficial erosion, which does not involve a fracture of the plaque's fibrous cap and has many characteristics that are distinct from the so-called ruptured vulnerable plaque. One can use novel imaging technologies such as um, optical coherence tomography uh, to interrogate whether an acute coronary syndrome is due to rupture or non-rupture, many of which are erosion. And you see that today in a contemporary series, about a third of acute coronary syndromes are due to the second mechanism. So we know exquisite detail about the mechanisms of plaque rupture, but scant information about erosion. Uh, and we think that the shift towards erosion fits clinical data that I don't have time to go into. So the contention is that superficial erosion is on the rise in this era of mastery over lipids. And this is where the nets come in. I'm not talking about nets in a vacuum, but talking about nets in the context of an important and perhaps growing human disease, superficial erosion, acute coronary syndromes. So I think everyone uh, who tuned into this uh, symposium uh, knows what nets are, and this is one of the key original papers. Uh, we know that neutrophils can be activated to undergo a specialized form of death that extrudes their DNA. How does this happen? Well, we know that our DNA is usually tightly wound up, uh, bound through electrostatic interactions to the histones, making a uh, very compact uh, nucleosome. You have enough DNA in your body to reach from here to the moon and back if it were all unwound, but obviously it's tightly coiled. There we have at higher power, uh, the optimers of the histones about which we'll hear uh, more later, showing how the DNA is constrained. Now there is a very special enzyme known as peptidyl arginine deaminase 4 or PAD4 that changes arginine, which is an amino acid, which is very rich in histones uh, accounting for the positive charge to citrulline. And this deimmunation all of a sudden breaks those ionic constraints that bind the DNA to the histones and it allows the DNA to unfurl. Think of the kitten in your living room who has gotten a ball of yarn and wound it all over the room. Now, not only do these nets, not only do these nets, let's get rid of that. Um, bring in the constituents of the granules of the neutrophils, but they can also pick up things from the environment, such as tissue factor, and make a solid state reactor on the surface of the lumen. Um, with a very industrious medical student, a, Kia, a fellow at Thibaut Kia, and a student, um, Agnès Araujo, we looked at our connection of uh, human atherosclerotic plaques and divided into those that have an erosion-like morphology versus a rupture-like morphology. And we found that there was a much higher incidence of 
episodes like this where there are nets that are sticking up from the endothelium. We believe that the nets act as a, as a solid state reactor right at the surface of the endothelium to promote the extension of damage, amplification, and thrombosis. And I don't have time to go through uh, all of the data that implicate TLR2 and endogenous ligands, such as low molecular weight forms of hadronin in this process. But suffice it to say that nets are an integral amplifier of the injury. Now, how can you study nets in vitro? They're pretty easy to, to make, as you can see here. And when you activate uh, isolated human neutrophils with forval myrstal acetate, uh, you have proteinase 3, cathepsin G, um, neutrophil elastase, and here is a histone H3, uh, and this is citrullinated histone. You don't see this if you don't activate the neutrophils. This happens over a matter of minutes, as you see here. And um, with another medical student, uh, now cardiology fellow, is about to start his cardiology fellowship, uh, Thomas Mawson and Eduardo Folco, a long-term associate of mine, we asked whether nets could activate endothelial cells since she's shown them present at the surface during erosion. And you can see that um, here we're looking functionally at clotting time getting uh, quicker, showing increased thrombosis. And we have published data showing that this is due to induction of tissue factor. Um, we know that net nets can turn on the entire inflammatory cascade that is signaled by NF kappa B, as you see here by the nuclear translocation of the active transcription factor. Uh, now, what is it that's activating the endothelial cells when they're exposed to nets? There are many possible candidates, as you see here, but uh, nets contain IL-1 beta and IL-1 alpha, uh, as we were able to show in some preliminary experiments. And uh, in the laboratory, uh, I said, well, let's uh, test the hypothesis that IL-1 beta is the agonist uh, because of my long-term interest in that mediator. And uh, as often happens, I was wrong it turned out to be IL-1-alpha that was the agonist. Uh, this work has been published in biochemical detail, but let me just summarize it, that uh, cathepsin G, which I told you associates the serine proteinase that is derived from the neutrophil associates with nets, and it degrades IL-1-beta to inactive fragments, uh, whereas IL-1-alpha actually gets cleaved to a mature form, uh, which is stable to cathepsin G, and uh, using antibody neutralization experiments, we were able to show that it is IL-1-alpha associated with nets, which can induce the adhesion molecules and the procoagulant tissue factor. Um, so we uh, published that and we believe that that shows a mechanism, a novel molecular mechanism by which nets may amplify and propagate endothelial dysfunction. So that's all in vitro. What about going in vivo? Well, I had a, a succession of wonderful uh, fellows working on this, including uh, Grégory Franck, who's now in Paris uh, at uh, Bichat. And uh, he devised a way of looking experimentally uh, at aspects of erosion by taking a intima, making an intima, tailoring an intima in mice that looks like the substrate of erosion, which is quite different from the lipid-rich uh, plaque. Um, and then he introduced a flow disturbance acutely uh, to mimic some of the uh, flow perturbations that have been associated with uh, endothelial apoptosis, I'll show you in a moment. Uh, so uh, the idea is we prepare the intima, let it heal. Now we have an intima that has many characteristics of the substrate of erosion, and then we introduce a flow disturbance. Why? Because Arante Gris laboratory uh, showed a number of years ago that the indices of apoptosis are much greater downstream of a plaque where the blood flow would be disturbed. Um, how did we introduce the disturbance? Uh, Gregory um, perfected a, uh, a well-known approach uh, and characterized it hydrodynamically, both uh, uh, by actually Doppler ultrasound showing that a constrictive cuff with a control of a non-constrictive cuff caused uh, flow disturbance. And in uh, simulation using fluid hydrodynamics showed that post cuff, you get these flow disturbances. And so then he's prepared to do experiments and he was able to show uh, that you get 
incredible carpeting of neutrophils if you look en face uh, upstream where you have the flow disturbance of the prepared intima uh, and for control either the non-constrictive cuff or the, the non previously injured artery do not accumulate these neutrophils. And the neutrophil accumulation associates with disruption of the endothelial monolayer. And here again, we're looking down using LY6G in, in uh, green fluorescence on an all fast view uh, post cuff where there's a flow disturbance. Um, he was able to uh, not only show uh, that you get neutrophil accumulation as you see here, uh, but he was able to show that, I'm just gonna fast forward here, uh, that uh, when you neutralize um, the accumulation of neutrophils uh, with various techniques that you preserve endothelial integrity. Um, now, what about the special enzyme, PAD4? Is that implicated in the netosis that we associate with this uh, experimental preparation? And uh, Greg was able to do that uh, by using a bone marrow chimera where the leukocytes lack PAD4. And indeed, we see much less citrullinated histone shown in green in the mice that lack PAD4 in their leukocytes, and we have improved endothelial continuity. Uh, the continuity is improved, and we see improved endothelial barrier function when we inhibit this enzyme, which is critical in net formation. Uh, so uh, PAD4 deficiency decreases uh, nets, as you see here, by the decrease in the citrullination signal. Um, when I did a little mini sabbatical at Bichat uh, with Jean-Baptiste Michel and Nicoletti and uh, Craig Ari uh, and uh, Peter Caliguri, uh, we actually looked at some human plaques and showed that this isn't just a mouse phenomenon, that in the left anterior descending coronary in this example, you see uh, citrullinated H4 in the uh, superficial lesion. I'm going to finish by saying, what do we do about it? Uh, well. Uh, with another fellow who's now back in Milano, Roberto Moderaro, we were able to test a hypothesis that we could direct nanoparticles to a place where erosion is happening uh, because when you lose the endothelial cells, you uncover the basement membrane, which is about 50% type 4 collagen. So using a, a peptide that recognizes a type 4 collagen, um, Roberto was able to direct nanoparticles that carried a small molecule inhibitor of PAD4 and was able to improve endothelial continuity and uh, decrease uh, net formation is gauged by uh, citrullination of histones and improve endothelial barrier function as well. So uh, this is a nanotherapeutic uh, approach uh, targeting type four collagen just to the places where there is erosion and it had beneficial effects preserving endothelial integrity and viability. Uh, so I think um, I'll stop there, simply uh, make the comment that you have to be nimble because there are young people uh, listening here. Uh, you have to keep your eye on a moving target and you need to be flexible. Uh, I spent uh, 20 years, maybe more, studying the macrophage in the plaque, uh, but the the, the clinical disease drew me uh, to have to study neutrophils, and it's wonderful to be able to try to master a new set of biology about which we'll hear more in the next talk. Uh, this is uh, Gregory, the hero of the uh, cuff story. Uh, this is Roberto uh, and his wife, Claudia, also a scientist, uh, who did the uh, nanoparticle study. This is Eduardo, who really drove a lot of the biochemistry. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for such a clear uh, uh, presentation of a very wide range of uh, really translational studies, uh, ranging from, uh, from pure discovery to uh, clinical delivery, which is a motto of uh, cardiovascular research uh, itself. Uh, we will uh, um, have uh, opportunity to uh, uh, answer some questions uh, directed to Peter uh, that some have already appeared on question and answer uh, uh, um, space. Please uh, type your question uh, there and we will uh, pass it.
uh, on um, and panelists can ask uh, questions directly. But at the moment, I will pass the chair to Christian as we will have a discussion with both speakers at the same time in the form of a dialogue. Please. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tom. And thank you, Peter, for this uh, beautiful uh, presentation and also for introducing the concept of uh, superficial erosion, which I think will be very interesting to pursue in, in, uh, in the future also with regards to what, what Carlos is doing. So with this, uh, I want to introduce Carlos silvestro -Roig. Uh Carlos obtained his PhD in 2013 in uh, Valencia uh, in biology and then moved on as a postdoctoral fellow uh, at first at the Amsterdam Medical Center and then since 2015 uh, here at the Institute for Cardiovascular Prevention uh, uh, with Oliver Söhnlein's group, and uh, since 2018, he's also a PI in our collaborative research center, uh, DFG funded here uh, on arteriosclerosis. And Carlos has uh, worked on uh, particularly, uh, yeah, designing and, and comparing models of blood rupture, so very much onto the topic, and has, uh, uh, as of late, produced seminal work on the role of uh, nets and net components uh, in uh, driving uh, unstable plugs. Uh, Carlos, we look very much forward to your interactive presentation. Thank you very much, Christian. So I can share my presentation. Can you see the presentation? Yes. But okay, perfect. Perfect. So thank you very much for this introduction and for having me here. It's an honor to be with uh, Professor Levy. Uh, during this seminar. And then I would like to talk about our work in NETS in cardiovascular disease. And uh, I will also skip a bit onto the pathology of uh, plaque and atherosclerosis because we all know how, um, very much about this. But I will mention here that uh, over these years, uh, neutrophils that have been neglected uh, to be participant in this disease actually have a, a stage dependent contribution uh, and this, uh, and in, depending on the stage of the disease, actually have different uh, mechanisms of action. And our lab has been focusing mainly in atherogenesis, the early stage of the disease. And here, uh, neutrophils are able to pave the way of uh, monocytes to enter into the lesion. And this is mediated by the release of preformed um, castellicidine or castellicidine G that actually permits the addition and uh, migration of monocytes to the lesion. However, when you take a look into the more advanced um, uh, lesions, actually, we are focused on plague rupture, uh, although Peter Levy was focused on plague erosion. But uh, here, actually, uh, nets come in, and actually many uh, papers have shown that nets are actually involved in the pathogenesis by interacting with different intimal cells, like, for example, PDCs, uh, activating them to produce interferon alpha or for example, by interacting with uh, macrophages to produce IL-1 beta or IL-18 through M2 and RP3. Uh, in our uh, work, actually, we also find that uh, neutrophils or nets uh, derived uh, from the neutrophils are actually toxic and can induce a small cell, cell death. And, and now we come in, in, in a minute with that. And for sure, not only um, plaque vulnerability or plaque with uh, unstable uh, features actually are important in plaque rupture, but also as uh, Professor Levy mentioned, uh, nets are very important also in plaque erosion, uh, having this toxic effect in this case in endothelial cells. So here uh, we were interested in understanding how uh, neutrophils participate in this part of the disease. And actually we develop a model that is uh, similar to uh, Peter was uh, performing. In this case, we employed a cast that is a series stretch modifier and that we uh, put into the uh, carotid artery from APOE on high fat diet. And this create uh, different uh, serious stress uh, patterns. And this in this low serious stress region, actually you perform or you generate these deep thin fibrous catheromas that are also seen in humans or resemble those seen in humans. So we started actually our project uh, analyzing the number of intimal neutrophils. And then we correlate with different signs of instability, either the stabilizing factors such as macrophage content or the size of the necrotic core, or stabilizing factors as, as uh, the small cell, cell counter or the thickness of the fibrous cap. And as you can see here, actually, neutrophils were supposedly correlating with the size of the necrotic core, but not so much with the macrophage content. On the other hand, it was inversely correlation with the amount of small cell cells, but also the thickness of the fibrous cap. And indeed, when you integrate all these parameters into an index, and that is the establishing factors divided, that the establishing factors, actually what you see is that the neutrophils positively correlate with more instability of the lesion. 
but we wanted to establish causality. And then to do so, we uh, either render neutropenia or neutrophilia. And to do so, uh, neutrophilia, neutrophilia was uh, generated by using an anti lysic G antibody to deplete neutrophils or using a mouse model that is uh, genetically uh, neutropenic. On the other hand, to induce neutrophilia, we uh, blocked CXGR4, that is a receptor that is in neutrophils, uh, either pharmacologically using AMD or genetically. And this allows to the release of uh, neutrophils that are retained in the bone marrow or in the lung that are released to the blood, and then they produce this situation of neutrophilia. And under these conditions, what we found here is that in, in neutropenic conditions here in green, you can find that actually there was an increase in the uh, thickness of the fibrous cap. And uh, here compared as a respective control in the dash line. And this also was associated with an increase in the small cell content, no change uh, or significant change in macrophage content, and an overall decrease of the vulnerability of the lesion. However, when you induce neutrophilia, actually you have the opposite effect. Here in red, you can see that it was a down small cell cells. The fibrous cap thickness was thinner and there was an increase in vulnerability. And so we were puzzled about this interaction between neutrophils and uh, small cell cells as compared with macrophages that is actually what we saw in early atherosclerosis before. And then what we found actually is when, when you analyze the distribution of these neutrophils within the lesion here in white, you see that they are actually in close proximity to the small cell cells in red, and they are more separated to the macrophages. And then we hypothesize that actually maybe small cell cells within the lesion are activated and they are releasing factors or chemotractants that uh, attract these neutrophils towards them. And to test this hypothesis, what we did is to activate the small cell cells with PJBB. That is a known grown factor that activates the small cell cells and the supernatants, uh, we took supernatants from them and actually uh, these supernatants were attracting neutrophils. But not only that, but these supernatants actually compared to the control supernatants were able to activate those neutrophils, as you can see here by uh, the production of ROS, and also induce the formation of these nets. So now here we actually speculate that maybe this net formation induced by uh, or primed by activated uh, small cell cells were actually causing these changes in the number of small cell cells and maybe through a toxic effect. So then actually when you analyze nets within the lesion, when uh, you correlate with the amount of small cell cells, you see that there is an inverse correlation, both in mouse atherosclerotic uh, lesions in our model, but also in human plaques. So then we move forward and then we say, okay, there is a, a, an in vivo relevance of this. And then uh, as uh, Peter Liebe uh, was shown before, uh, we use uh, an inhibitor and a genetic model to uh, block actually net release through interfering uh, of the enzyme path four. And uh, using uh, either uh, both uh, me um, methods, actually what we found is that in our model, we can again uh, rescue uh, the number of muscle cells to increase the thickness of the fibrous cap and overall decrease the vulnerability of these lesions. So we can say here that actually nets derived from these neutrophils are actually change, uh, inducing the muscle cell uh, changes and numbers in, in, in this uh, lesions and actually uh, promoting vulnerability. But we wanted to uh, go further and understand which actually which components in these nets were actually driving this toxicity. And we tested different um, uh, components. And uh, actually we found that only when you actually blocked histones uh, within these nets, actually you are able to prevent this toxicity, in particular H2A and H4. But actually when you uh, release these histones using a DNA treatment, and then you remove the DNA scaffold, actually only blocking histone H4 was able to reduce the toxicity as compared to histone H2A. So we believe that actually histone H4 is actually causing this toxicity. But it was in vitro and to prove this in vivo, we employed again in our model uh, using antibodies against histone H4 that were delivered in during the last four weeks of the model where the lesion is actually already uh, formed. Within these uh, treated uh, uh, animals, what we found is that actually there is an increase in the number of muscle cells within this lesion with an increase of thickness of the fibrous cap and again, a reduced uh, vulnerability of the lesion. So we can now say actually that uh, net derived histone H4 is actually causing this uh, black vulnerability. But then uh, one thing that we found actually is how uh, this histone H4 was causing this uh, cell toxicity. And we were puzzled of the speed of this um, uh, cell death. And then actually uh, I will summarize here because for the sake of time, but uh, what we found is actually that histone H4 
that this is one of the most cationic uh, proteins in the body. It's actually interacting with the membrane uh, through these uh, electrolytic discharges. And this actually produce uh, uh, um, changes in the membrane that produce the release of ATP to the medium and uh, um, produce events of cell swelling, suggesting that actually stonish 4 is causing cell lysis. Indeed, we uh, perform a, a different um, biophysical um, uh, experiments to prove actually that Estonish 4, when interact with the plasma membrane, here we use a scan ion microscopy, we found that in live muscle cells in a period of only 20 minutes after adding this Estonish 4, you can find that you generate this bending of the membrane, suggesting that actually Estonish 4 was producing pores in the um, membrane of these muscle cells. But then uh, now we wanted to address uh, how this is happening and which part of the Eastern H4 is actually having this membrane activity. And uh, here we collaborate with Gerard Wong from the University of California, and they have a, a trained algorithm that is able to predict within the amino acid sequence which region is actually having um, membrane activity or capacity to produce pores. And as you can see here in the case of Eastern H4, the first two amino acids has the higher score. Indeed, this is part of the N-terminal part of the histone. So then to prove uh, these uh, predictions, we employed a small act angle X-ray scattering and we incubate uh, histone for N-terminus together with unilaminar vesicles. And then what we analyze here is the negative Gaussian curvature that is a process that is happening normally uh, with pore forming proteins that is required before forming this uh, pore in the membrane. And then uh, what we found is actually using different uh, type of unilaminar vesicle with different compositions in a dose dependent manner here in peptide to lipid ratio, you see that there is an increase in the amount of these negative Gaussian curvature structures, suggesting actually then that the memory activity of this histone H4 or the capacity to produce uh, pores is actually localized in the N-terminus part. And knowing this actually uh, was very helpful because then we could uh, perform a computer modeling to uh, define how this interaction uh, was happening. And we were able to design uh, interfering peptides and there are cyclic peptides that could interfere with this interaction. Here we choose HYPE that stands for uh, histone inhibitory peptide that uh, to test this. And then we prove uh, that uh, both in vitro but also in vivo, when you applied HYPE, uh, during the last four weeks of the treatment, again, you are able to uh, increase the amount or, or the thickness of the fibrous cap and rescue again the number of muscle cells and overall decrease the variability of these lesions. So we have a new therapeutic uh, opportunity to actually um, block uh, Eastonish 4 and reduce uh, the variability. And here you have a summary video where of this uh, first part of the talk and uh, where we find that actually, sorry, neutrophil actually uh, transmigrate into the lesion, in the bus lesion. And when they're in close proximity to the small cells, they are prime and activated to release those nets. And these nets are carrying different proteins, but among them, there are the histones, and in particular, histone H4, that is released uh, from the DNA scaffold to interact with the plasma membrane. And this interaction is happening through uh, electrostatic, electrostatic charges. And this will generate actually the formation of pores that will produce eventually uh, the cell lysis and the cell death of this muscle cell. And when you have this continuously, this will eventually produce the thinning of the fibrous cap and it will increase the variability. So uh, here uh, in, in a continuation of this project, actually uh, we um, are trying to find new uh, ways to block this histone H4. And as you can see here, Again, this is how is uh, this negative Gaussian curvature produced. Here you can see the structure of this N-terminus part. And here is how actually the sex experiments are resulting. Actually, you can see that the appearing of these peaks in the diagram reflect actually the formation of this negative Gaussian curvature. So what we were interested in is actually in a particular protein that is APOA. That is the main protein in HDL, but the uh, biophysical properties of this protein makes that uh, it could modify the structure of the membrane, uh, preventing actually the interaction of the histone H4. And indeed, actually, uh, they are having described different mimetics of this APOA that are able to improve uh, atherosclerosis in animal models, but also has been used in humans um, where uh, one single dose or multiple oral dose of these uh, mimetics, in this case D4F, it was able to reduce inflammation in high-risk patients. 
So actually, we predicted actually that this uh, EMD4F is able to produce an opposite bending of this uh, membrane that is a positive Gaussian curvature, therefore preventing the interaction of histone H4. And indeed, when you produce a sex experiment, you can see that in an increasing amount of D4F and in presence of H4, you can see that there is a decrease uh, of these peaks, meaning that you are re reducing the formation of this negative Gaussian curvature. So then to prove that these uh, biophysical results are actually um, have a biological uh, effect, actually uh, here we didn't use a cardiovascular model, but in, instead we uh, use uh, the toxemia uh, induced by LPS injection. And we know that this model actually also produced the infiltration of notables within different organs. Uh, and in particular, it will produce uh, the release of nets, as you can see here in different organs, or for example, here the liver or the lung, and the release of extra nuclear histone H4. And what we can find in this model is actually that if you analyze the amount of uh, tissue damage by a uh, tunnel, you can see in this chorelogram that the amount of tunnel actually positively correlate in blue with the amount of neutrophils, the amount of nets, but also the amount of extra nuclear histone H4. So then we wanted to prove actually that D4F can prevent this. And we first uh, use an in vitro approach using different cell lines of endothelial cells, small cell cells, macrophages or hepatocytes, and using a fixed dose of histone H4, you can see that in a dose dependent manner, you, there is a reduction of the toxicity um, when you employ this D4F. But this also happened indeed, actually not in vitro, but also in vivo, when you uh, co uh, inject not LPS, but also with D4F, you can see that actually there was a significant reduction in the amount of uh, tissue damage within the liver and also in the lung by uh, measuring this uh, uh, positive uh, toxicity. So then um, uh, overall, uh, as a take home message, I can say that the netophils and nets are actually important drivers of uh, atherosclerotic plaque instability. That uh, we can find that histone induced cell lysis within the arterial tissue actually promotes the chronicity of the inflammation. And here, the discovery of uh, netosis and its derivatives, in particular histones uh, as a cytotoxic and inflammatory components, can have uh, can be uh, seen as a novel therapeutic targets, but also as a prominent biomarkers of CBD, and that can help to patient stratification and also to develop patient therapy therapies, and also can be extended to other diseases where tissue damage is actually involved. And with that, I would like to uh, thank to all the members of the lab, and in particular Oliver Sunline and Quinte Braster uh, here that was doing this uh, job with me, and also uh, all the collaborators and the funding. And thank you very much, and we'll be happy to, to have your questions. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, uh, Carlos, and uh, uh, also again, Peter, for these two great and uh, complimentary uh, presentations. Um, uh, Tom and I have discussed how to, to best proceed with, with the questions and we try basically to um, select a few and without uh, having, can, without the claim of, of being complete, you know, from the list of your questions that, that popped up in the F&A. Um, and uh, maybe before we alternate and I give back, hand back to uh, Tom, I can, I can start uh, maybe with, with a question. Uh, to Peter uh, that uh, came up from uh, Casey Liu and uh, from uh, um, blah, 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 was Flat Erich. Uh, so basically, um, uh, Casey asked whether there are patients with mutations uh, in PET4 known that would uh, possibly affect the uh, uh, net formation and cardiovascular risk. And uh, accordingly, Clet asked whether there's anything known from cardiovascular GIVA studies that points to a role of nets in cardiovascular disease? Yeah, so uh, as far as I know, uh, PAD4 has not come up in any of the GWAS or Mendelian randomization studies. I think it would be uh, really interesting to see if there are variants in PAD4 that affect this activity and uh, to uh, evaluate that. I think it's a very um, nice genetic approach to try to validate in humans. Uh, the relevance of a lot of the work that we do in vitro and in experimental preparations. Thank you. Uh, uh, Carlos, do you want to uh, add anything? Yeah. No, no, it's a, it's a good question. And, and as, uh, as Peter said, uh, this is to my knowledge, no, 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 nothing described. 
but also um, uh, maybe also considering not only path four, but also there are other nets that they're independent of path four. So maybe maybe there are other um, uh, proteins that they can be uh, checked. For example, gasdermin D has been shown to be important. So maybe in the future, genetic study can also target different proteins that could be involved in this in this process, actually. All right, the uh, uh, Claudia Shonikhen uh, is asking, uh, what are the non-vascular, non-endothelial or non-plaque related triggers uh, in patients uh, for net formation, which can be particularly important as these factors could stimulate the procoagulant properties of endothelial cells? Uh, I think it's directed to Peter, but... So I, I, I anticipated this question and also uh, Pinaka Yuri has been uh, you know, saying, could we have low level endotoxin either from periodontitis or uh, because of impaired uh, intestinal barrier function, epithelial function. And so uh, last night I did a little Google search. I'm not gonna project it, but I will tell you that I crossed COVID-19 with uh, NETS and came up in 0.5 seconds uh, with uh, 200,000 uh, hits. So I'm sure that, that that's an exaggeration, but there are dozens of publications about uh, and that's related to uh, thrombotic complications, which we're seeing all too often in our patients with uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, so this is maybe an extreme case, and maybe uh, what Ina is suggesting, and that is that uh, there may be low-level uh, PAMP, you know, pathogen-associated molecular patterns uh, from either leakage of, from the intestinal microbiome or from, as she points out, a periodontal disease, uh, could give you some chronic low-level stimulation. Uh, you know, one of the recent papers uh, just published in JAMA Cardiology, it may not even be in print yet, uh, looking at nets in acute uh, coronary syndromes, they did aspiration um, of uh, thrombi from patients who are undergoing uh, acute coronary syndromes. And they also, um, many studies like that have shown uh, evidence of nets there in, in ACS. Uh, but what they did is they showed that uh, patients with ACS, they're neutrophils, but not neutrophils from control subjects or chronic stable antigen patients were primed for net formation. Uh, so there's, there's a priming factor and could be PAMPs, could be uh, cytokine. I think that that's a, a question of uh, great current interest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I may add also to this, like uh, it has been recently shown that also bacteremia and endotoxemia can uh, trigger net formation subsequent uh, uh, monocyte uh, achievement that's again then pro arterogenic and that can also be targeted with antibodies to histone uh, 2A. So um, I think there's, there's a lot, lot more to, to learn about that. So maybe, maybe a question to, to, to Carlos, uh, because you're looking at this pore uh, formation capacity of the histone H4, mostly in the interaction of neutrophils with osmosis muscle cells. Uh, but if we look at uh, Peter's superficial erosion, uh, how basically could you envision also an effect of neutrophils directly interacting with the um, endothelial cells or even in a sub-endothelial space that could also basically drill holes uh, into the endothelial cells and then further promote erosion. Yes, uh, for sure. I mean, uh, this is one question that we always have and is uh, that the, the specificity of the histone H4 is actually zero. So I think it will actually kill every cell that is going in, in, in in front of him. So, but uh, but it's true that one of the, the reasons that we find this particular effect on small cells uh, stands out of the, the position of the neutrophil within the lesion. We find that it's predominantly in the fibrous cap uh, when they are uh, transmigrating um, and we don't find this much interaction with the, with other cells. Uh, saying that uh, in our model, we don't find neoendogenesis. So I cannot say whether they could interact, for example, in humans, it's more happening more uh, often. They could interact with the small vessels within the, or the field cells inside the lesion. But for sure, in the case of, uh, like uh, in, for Peter Levy, um, um, the erosion, uh, it could also impact on the field cells. I think it's quite in a specific, it's just the location of the neutrophil and where it's activated and where this uh, histone can actually have an effect. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Do you want to add anything to this? Uh, no, I, I think that uh, the 
focus on the role of the neutrophil in human atherosclerosis at what stage and where the neutrophil is actually uh, causally involved in, in atherogenesis, lesion evolution, and in the complications, I think is a very rich area. As I said, it's wonderful to uh, having spent a quarter century uh, thinking about macrophages to think about another cell type. I agree, it's refreshing. And somebody, uh, one of the, the, the participants is asking about neutrophilia. Can you uh, induce uh, actually uh, the complications of the plaque in mice by inducing neutrophilia? So yeah. Carlos uh, showed us some, some data about that, I think. What, yes. I, what I can say, uh, you, Carlos can, can remind people of the experiment that he showed, that um, it's a very well-documented phenomenon clinically that there is a relationship between neutrophils uh, and outcomes. Uh, and uh, we just very recently in the latest European Heart Journal with uh, Nicola Adamstein, who is one of our, our uh, residents now, uh, working with Paul Ritker in a number of the clinical trials that we've been involved with, looked at the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. And it's a remarkably uh, good predictor of outcomes. So. Uh, looking at a uh, shift in the balance between innate immunity with the neutrophil front and center and adaptive immunity just in peripheral blood uh, gauged by lymphocyte numbers, uh, it seems to be quite robust as a predictor of events. And you mentioned macrophages and uh, one of the viewers is asking about their ability to generate uh, extracellular traps. And uh, you know, this, this would bring it back to the more classical world. Yeah. Well, Carlos should, should remind people about uh, the neutrophilia experimentally, and then Carlos, maybe you can handle that. Yes. Uh, well, in, in our model, we, we induce neutrophilia by, as I said, with blocking sixer for because it's a known um, um, retention molecule within the, the bone marrow and the lung for neutrophils. So you can actually block pharmacologically using AMD, uh, or you can use a genetic model, uh, and it will release those neutrophils to the to the circulation to generate uh, this uh, neutrophilia. But there are different models. You can also use GCSF administration, or there are, there are different models to, to generate. And regarding the macrophages, uh, it's actually we were asked uh, to, to check in our model, uh, at least, actually 90% or 99% of the nets that we found were lysg positive. We couldn't find a relation uh, or a hint that it could be also derived from macrophages, at least in, in our model. All right. Christian? That's very interesting, and I may also add that hyperlipidemia is, of course, also driving the, the release of, of neutrophils, so that can also close the mechanistic loop then to proarthrogenic effects. Uh, Peter, maybe one, one final question also to, to that, because you showed also the relevance of uh, disturbed flow as it, uh, as it occurs upstream or also at, at bifurcations. Uh, and uh, for neutrophil uh, um, adhesion and, and, and activation. So I'm actually wondering what, what, what's the hen and what's, what's the egg? Because we know that uh, disturbed flow by itself can also Im Im impair the endothelial capacity for, uh, for renewal and it's also pro-apoptotic on the endothelial side. So uh, you may wonder what's, what's better to target first, the endothelial susceptibility or basically the subsequent neutrophil activation or Vice versa. Yeah. Um, so the story in humans is gauged by um, by computational fluid dynamic fluid dynamics uh, in OCT and, and measurements in humans. Um, you know, my my uh, friend and collaborator I K Jang, who's one of the primary exponents of using OCT, um, it says that the the flow disturbance and, and erosion. Uh, can be upstream as well as downstream. Uh, so it's not quite as simple as we show with our uh, simple cuffs uh, or constrictors in, in vivo. So the, the uh, mechanical uh, biochemical transduction mechanisms that are involved uh, are still, I think, up for grabs. And I think it's a very ripe area for study. Just co coming back to the neutrophilia, I want to, for the young people, because we have well, we had almost 500 people at the peak here, um, you know, I, I made the point that you can direct your laboratory questions based on clinical observations. And my predecessor as chief of cardiology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Sam Levine, wrote a book in 1923, I think, or 29, where he said that some of the most constant uh, features 
that accompany um, myocardial infarction, uh, which was just being been recognized as an entity in the 1920s, um, are uh, an increase in the neutrophil count and fever. And of course, we know that fever is mediated by interleukin-1. So I've just spent my career uh, figuring out the mechanisms and we need to be careful clinical observations of a very smart doctor. This is very important because it brings us to the second part of, of the discussion, which uh, as I alluded to, we aim to provide some sort of advice to uh, our uh, viewers uh, who are interested in into what are the, the what is the secret of, of really well designed and well performed study? And in a way, you answered already the first question that we received, uh, uh, which is how to choose the questions that are worth pursuing uh, among uh, a, a multiplicity of observations that uh, that in the lab uh, we encounter. And uh, I think that in a way you've already answered this, but I wonder if any of you wants to add anything because uh, this was directly a question they, that that uh, our uh, uh, colleagues have asked. You know, it has to be something that gets you up in the morning uh, excited. Uh, and different people will be excited by different things. So uh, Michael Brown, uh, the co-discoverer of the LDL receptor pathway, who I admire greatly, said in several lectures I heard him give, he said to the young people, you know, when you discover the secret of life, it'll be 14 angstroms. And then that's completely something I wouldn't get out of bed for. I get out of bed for solving a clinical problem that I can see at the bedside. Uh, so... Uh, you know, that's the spectrum, 14 angstroms versus a clinical problem. And um, I think both are valid, but it, you know, I like to study important things, uh, big things that you could do something about. That's my own inclination. I think it's, it's always an important point. Uh, my uh, advisor at uh, Oxford would used to say, always ask important questions and answer them only using most reliable methods, which I think is a secret for, for a well-designed study. Carlos, do you want to add anything to this? I, I agree with, with Peter, but also I am a biologist and I always say that uh, you always try to follow your curiosity and also try to always uh, answer your, your, your question that it appears in the shower, maybe, as you said. Uh, so I don't know, I think everything has uh, relative importance. And, and I think here, I mean, you can always have the clinical uh, uh, output. Normally there is always a clinical uh, implication but also just to, to follow your, your, your curiosity and your, your, your willing to, to know things, I think. So I always try to check multiple disciplinary uh, situations. And in my project, this project was actually very clinical, but try to always have an open mind, I would say as well. Yeah, but per, per, perhaps basically it doesn't matter so much whether you start at the 14 angstroms or whether, whether you start with a clinical uh, observation. I think it's also the, the, the dynamics that counts. It's always a bidirectional process and you have to drive, you know, to move from A to B somewhere in, in order to, to address the really important questions. You can look through either, either side of the telescope. Yeah. Both of you alluded to a combination of clinical and basic as, uh, and discoveries in, in, in single papers. One of the, the, the viewers is asking about the balance, uh, how to sort of strike an optimal balance for, for high impact publication between these. Of course, probably it will depend on, on the uh, stage of discovery and many other factors, but maybe there is a, a, a little bit simplified answer to this question. Peter or Carlos? You think we should start with clinical or start with the basic? No, the, so, so the recipe these days for, uh, you know, you, you raised in the introduction, how do you publish a paper in nature or nature medicine, is you do your, your mouse study, your in vitro study, and then you knock on the door of your friendly clinician and get a few biospecimens and make a few measurements, and that elevates your study. I, I always uh, tell the, the fellows uh, that, We'll, we'll be able to publish in a better journal if you put in really human data. So usually it's the icing on the cake. Um, that's more cosmetic, but that's a practical hint for getting published in the top tier journals. Yes, I, I agree. I completely agree. I mean, at the end, it's uh, always an add-on to your uh, initial hypothesis and, and your mechanistic studies, but you always need um, uh, this uh, this part, mainly with, with nature and all these more conceptual um, papers uh, sometimes, but you always need this part. And I would say that normally comes at the end, although maybe you write it at the beginning. At the end. <laughs> so it's uh, how you put it at the end, or how you tell it is maybe different, how you came out in the project. 
Yeah, that's an important point for the young people to know that science, the way that it is described in a beautiful paper and the way the struggle day to day in which a uh, project evolves is completely different. Completely different. Uh, so don't get discouraged. You need to have a wonderful appetite uh, for frustration in order to uh, thrive in uh, biomedical science. Yeah. Okay. And probably in every uh, sort of field of life, perseverance and uh, and this sort of uh, strength is, uh, is is the most important component of success. But I sometimes wonder, you know, maybe if we reverted the process, if we asked the question based on a translational uh, uh, material, so for example, studies in human vessels uh, or human tissues, and then develop mechanistic answers to already uh, uh, well uh, uh, established uh, observations in humans, that uh, might provide a more translatable uh, uh, um, sort of uh, uh, pathway to, uh, to, 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 to papers that, that do not suffer from the point of, point, uh, point of view of pharmaceutical industry of non-reproducibility and so on in, when, when introduced to humans. What do you think about that? Well, yes, I think I think also. I mean, and when actually, if I can say one experience myself in my PhD, I started like this. I started by studying polymorphisms, and then uh, it was a human part. And then actually, after my part was to demonstrate the mechanistics uh, behind this 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 link. It was studying restenosis uh, in that moment, and and actually it was actually my thesis always the other way around. I started with the human, and then I I. I Add my part that it was the mechanistic part. So in this case, it was it was like this. So I guess both of them, both of these are, are can be unified. And then after the discovery of mechanism, you fine tune it in, in in a very narrow and focused human experiment as this icing on the cake uh, that uh, Peter was describing. Uh, Christian, uh, Peter, Peter mentioned also the fever and the R1. I mean, this is also like uh, if you've heard a talk by Charles Dinarello, you will also know basically how you can arrive from, you know, the, uh, the simple observation how fever emerges in a rabbit or somewhere to, to IL-1, yeah. yeah. It, Charles is a real hero because he purified interleukin-1 by screening um, cephid XG 50 column fractions by looking at the increase in rectal temperature in rabbits. So yeah. think of that. Um, exactly. It was brute force. Yeah. And we have some, uh, maybe uh, some other panelists who would uh, want to ask uh, some questions or comment uh, at this moment. No, if uh, not, uh, maybe before we conclude, there is one more uh, question that has been repeated by a few uh, uh, people uh, regarding the nets and their potential association with and relationship to microvascular dysfunction, because more and more we are understanding that microvascular disease may be important in heart failure and many other uh, diseases. So, uh, so could you comment on, on this? Are there any studies or do, what do we know about this? Well, I, I mentioned COVID-19 and the thrombotic complications and COVID-19 is so rampant. Uh, we have uh, big arteries with the strokes that are occurring in young people with no apparent risk factor other than SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, we have uh, venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. I've seen a lot of that uh, when on duty in the hospital in COVID-19, uh, but also microvasculature. So if you look at the path pathology reports which have come out uh, on autopsies of uh, patients with COVID-19, the microvasculature uh, is definitely affected with um, microthrombi, and there are a number of studies that have localized markers of nets in the microvessels. So I think that it's really uh, really very important. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Peter said everything, but it, yeah, it's true. I mean, I mean, I think nets are uh, now known in multiple vascular diseases, cardiovascular disease, and including uh, microvascular, but also microvascular. And I think it's just a, a reaction of an pre a hyperactivated neutrophil, and it's just that before we we didn't know that it was there. Until, until somebody said, okay, there is a net here. Now, I think uh, we are now checking on that, but it's just a uh, super activated neutrophil that is releasing this. And the question is how this is happening because it's still not really known if there are different kind of nets that they are different and which neutrophils are actually um, doing that because it's not all of neutrophils. This is actually for me the most important or interesting thing 
because not not the one hundred percent of the field do that. That is exciting and uh, can sort of uh, allow us in the future maybe be a little bit more specific in targeting if we understand this. Yeah. Indeed. Are there any final comments from uh, from our speakers? Uh, once again, I would like to thank both of you for really comprehensive talks that in a very short time, because as we discussed, the attention span on uh, uh, Zoom is uh, considered to be much shorter than in the room. Uh, therefore, we ask you to really be succinct and, uh, and, and rapid, but, uh, but you really uh, sort of enlightened uh, our viewers uh, about all the most important aspects of, of this problem. Thank you very much for this. Any final comments from you? I will just say that thank you very much for the invitation and it's an honor to be participating in this seminar. Uh, so I want to congratulate the cardiovascular research and the ESC uh, Council on Basic Science uh, for this format, which I think is wonderful. You have one person with gray hair, one person with black hair, uh, and uh, different approaches uh, and a big audience that you've got. So I think that this is a wonderful uh, format, and I look forward to viewing them in the future. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you much. All of our viewers and people who joined us uh, today. We had uh, at the peak time uh, uh, 480 people in Zoom and uh, nearly 30 people who decided to connect via YouTube, even though they were not uh, directed there. So um, over 500 people, which is a huge uh, honor for us. Please submit your best uh, cardiovascular discoveries to cardiovascular research and help it uh, grow. And uh, I will ask uh, uh, Christian to uh, uh, close uh, and uh, provide some closing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom, uh, Peter, and Carlos. And I am very happy that, that this format, uh, thanks to your efforts, really worked out that, that well. And I hope that we can continue that uh, over the next uh, few months with uh, similar uh, interesting uh, combinations and, and, and topics. And uh, also thanks also for all the online feedback that has been uh, very uh, positive and uh, obviously very well received. Uh, and uh, so we look forward to, to the next uh, seminars. Thanks a lot again. Thank, Thank you. you very much to everyone. And remember to read cardiovascular research. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I have to disclose a conflict of interest. Bye-bye. <laughs>